So thank you all so much for coming this afternoon. Uh, thank you, Dr. Carter. Uh, thank you, Clayton, for the invitation and to the whole team for welcoming here, welcoming me here today. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of the research that I've been doing, uh, one project in particular. And I think that as I proceed through the talk, you might hear some of those reasons that Dr. Kitsi mentioned about why uh, people don't feel welcome in the library profession, right? And then that translates into why people perhaps do not feel welcome in libraries. So the title of today's talk is Acknowledging History in Order to Disrupt It, Unearthing the Segregated History of Library and Information Science. And what the plan is for today is to tell you about a project that I did entitled the Gisless Carnegie Scholars, uh, but in order to kind of set the stage for the Carnegie Scholars, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of segregation in libraries and the legacy uh, that still remains. Okay, so forgive me, I'm, I'm experimenting with this mouse. Okay. All right, so Clayton was very lovely in her introduction of me, but I always have to show this picture of my mommy on the left uh, and Dr. Carla Hayden on the right, right? So for me, this is um, a very important picture, a very important representation, right? So um, my mother was the first college graduate in her family. She was a registered nurse. And so when it came time for me to start thinking about higher education, and I don't mean bachelors, um, I mean, graduate work, there was no question. Her response, her question to me was, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm going to get a job. No, no. What program are you enrolling in? All right. So her, her expectation of me is that she had graduate degrees that I was going to match her and surpass her. So when I got my PhD, uh, she actually asked my dean at the time, well, where's my diploma? Like, I, I, earned, my, I earned that PhD just like she did. But to juxtapose this, uh, Dr. Carla Hayden is the first African-American woman to be our Librarian of Congress. So just to talk about uh, what the possibilities are for people of color in this profession, and that's really uh, what this talk is about, what we really can do and how we have perhaps been uh, faced with barriers and obstacles uh, that really don't need to be there. All right, so as I mentioned, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the brief, uh, brief history of the seg segregation in LAS. And so um, I was a librarian before I became a faculty member, so that means that I'll have lots of citations and references for you if you want to dig a little bit deeper into this topic. So when we talk about the history of library segregation, a bit of history, so I'm just going to read you a little something to give you some context. So to further emphasize the need for quality services to diverse populations, a bit of history is presented. The history of library services to diverse populations is complex and not, only, not always positive or flattering. Known for welcoming immigrants from other lands and preparing them for life in the United States, North American libraries and their associations were also deeply segregated. The author, Rosemary DeMont, recounts the early history of blacks in library education and services prior to the Civil War and the subsequent library services that were available to black communities, particularly in the South. In a notable portion of her historical treatment, Dumont relays the stark refusal of many library schools to admit black students in the 1930s. LIS educator and historian Dr. Wayne Wiegand has done extensive research about the segregation that existed in libraries in the South during which time, oh, sorry, during which time uh, minorities literally put their freedom and safety on the line to advocate for equal library services for all community members. Constrained by Jim Crow laws and other legal issues, in addition to the prejudice, prejudices of members of the library profession, minorities were referred to branch libraries, where they were provided with inferior service and collections. Many scholars have detailed the path of libraries during the civil rights era, but even after that particularly difficult period in history, services to diverse populations, minorities in particular, were slow to emerge and were somewhat inconsistent. Other literature discusses the development of ethnic and special collections, in particular libraries and regions, 
So this was a start, but it still indicated that services to diverse populations were not yet mainstream. Even in current times, there are still ample examples that libraries in less affluent areas still demonstrate informal segregation based on the amount and quality of services and resources and by virtue of the neighborhood in which they are located. So just to give you a couple of concrete examples, uh, American Libraries, the publication of the American Library Association, did a series in June of 17 that detailed some of these historical episodes. So libraries, particularly in the South, were frequently sites of sit-ins and demonstrations and featured young people, right, which is what a lot of what we're seeing uh, in current times. And they wanted to integrate library, libraries so they didn't have to go to the colored branch or receive no services at all. And so this was part and parcel of the larger landscape, right? So we're approaching the civil rights movement and the demonstrations uh, and all of the activities that were happening in order to work for equal rights for everyone. So we have the Tougaloo Nine, we have the Greenville Eight. Um, there are any number of examples of sit-ins and different uh, protests that happened in and around libraries. So here are the references that I promised you. So some of these, um, I mentioned uh, Dubon's article uh, when I was speaking earlier. Um, Dr. Cheryl Knott, uh, when she was writing, it was Cheryl Knott Malone. Uh, Dr. Knott is at the University of Arizona. Dr. Knott has done some stellar work um, about segregation in libraries and what that looked like and what that meant for the populations that were being served and not served. Um, at the bottom here, we have another book by Dr. Wiegand that I believe is coming out today um, about the desegregation of public libraries in Jim Crow South. So I am happy to see all of these different references um, and that people are actually doing this work to tell the stories of the profession, right? I think a lot of us who have gone through MLS programs um, did, were not aware of this history. I certainly was not. So when I started doing the work for the Carnegie Scholars that I'll get to in just a moment, um, you know, and just in my personal reading, had begun digging and learning more and more um, because it was not something that I was alerted to uh, in my library program. So again, uh, to Darren's point, to some of the points of the people, of the folks on the panel, we not only do we have to come to grips with our history, however good or bad it may be, we then have to make space for these conversations. So just to give you a little bit more about um, a couple of points, right? There are many, many different things uh, that happened over the course of time if we wanted to talk about a timeline of what social justice looks like in libraries. So for example, in 1905, uh, the Brevard Street Library for Negroes opens in Charlotte as an independent institution. It is the first public library for blacks in North Carolina. We have the Hampton Library Institute uh, <coughs> slash library school that existed between 1925 and 1939. Hampton was a, the library school was a very, very important uh, historical entity, right? So when librarians of color wanted to get their degree, they were very roundly and quickly rejected uh, from other white schools that did not want them there. So for, for an entire generation of black librarians, this is where they received their education. And thankfully for us, they were able to do that and then go on and um, do good things in the field. In 1929, ALA issued a survey to library school directors, and I'll read you um, the results of some of that in just a moment. In 1936, the ALA conference was segregated according to Virginia laws. So librarians of color were invited to attend the conference, but they were not able to stay at conference hotels. Um, depending on where the various meetings were, they were not allowed to enter, right? Because we're still dealing with colored only spaces. So then it became, you know, the discussion of, you know, is this profession really welcoming? Do people of color really belong in librarianship? Um, and as a side note, I would say that we are still having some of those conversations in 2018. All right, so I showed you a picture of the Greenville 8, and that happened in 1960. 
And so this brings us up to 1970, which was the enactment of the Title IIB Fellowship of the Higher Education Act of 1965. All right. So let me tell you a little bit um, before I get to the Carnegie Scholars to finish up on this historical context. In 1929, the American Library Association issued a survey to library school directors, and some of the responses were bold and unequivocal in their refusal to admit African American students to their program. The director of Pratt Institute said, no Negro applicant has ever measured up to the standards of the School of Library Science, and none has therefore been admitted. The, the director at the University of Michigan stated, my own impression is that the school at Hampton Institute should be quite sufficient to provide such colored librarians as are needed for some time to come. It seems to me that the Board of Education will do far to send students to Hampton rather than to urge them to come to other institutions where their presence is a distinct embarrassment. As a result of this not uncommon sentiment, aspiring <coughs> African American librarians uh, were trained predominantly at the Hampton Institute Library, as I have mentioned. There was also the Negro Teacher Librarian Training Program. There was the Atlanta University School of Library Service, which then uh, turned into Clark Atlanta, which unfortunately closed in 2003. There was a high school apprenticeship program in Louisville, Kentucky, and the North Carolina Central Library School, uh, which is now part of North Carolina Central University. So this all brings me to the Carnegie Scholars. So as you know, I am at the University of Illinois, um, and we actually don't have that many students of color in our program. I am one of two African-American faculty members, uh, one of two minority faculty members in general on that faculty. And knock on wood or whatever this is up here, um, in a month I will be one of the first domestic minorities to be tenured in a unit that is over 120 years old. So to say that in this profession, um, and I was a librarian for many years before going to Illinois faculty, in this profession, we still have firsts. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that we won't have too many more firsts. Um, but this was a particular first at Illinois. So in looking through one of the magazines, I see the picture that's on the screen. Uh, and it's just very brief blurb. These were the Carnegie Scholars. These were students that were here from 1970 to 1972. Um, and that was really it. So I'm asking around, who are these people? Right? Like, I didn't know we had African Americans running through these hallways. And what happened to them? Um, because, you know, we all know the phrase, representation matters. So I needed to know who these people were. So it's a talk for another day, how many obstacles I had to do this research. No one knew who these people were. Maybe she knew who these people were, but would, didn't, want, didn't want to talk to me about it. There were no records. Um, it took me almost 18 months to find someone in uh, the foundation office at the university at large to actually give me their contact information so I could contact them. Then once I contacted them, uh, this was a group of 30 uh, African American, there were two Latino and Latina students. Um, once I contacted them, some 40 years after their experience at Illinois, some of them spoke to me right away. I'm so happy that the university is finally acknowledging my presence because no one's ever followed up with me, no one's ever asked me, you know, how I felt about my experience in Illinois. And there were other people who said, absolutely not. I will not talk to you about that experience. This is 40 years later, okay? So to back up a little bit, um, again, Carnegie Scholars Fellowship Program. This was a fellowship program that was funded by the Carnegie Corporation. And so the Carnegie Corporation also funded the Hampton Institute and other uh, library education entities. And so this was a program for master students. They received full tuition. Uh, they said they received a very generous stipend. Um, and so the goal was to diversify the workforce. 
right? We're still trying to do that now. So before I proceed, I should point out that the gentleman sitting is Dr. Terrence Crowley. And Dr. Crowley was faculty at Illinois at that time, and he was the one who wrote the grant and literally shepherded the students through the program. So, Carnegie Scholars. Now to back up just a little bit, to give you a little bit more Illinois history. So I gave you some of that timeline. And when we start talking about uh, the Civil Rights Act, we start talking about Brown v. Board, we start talking about Title IIb. So this is a very contentious time, not only at Illinois, but in higher ed in a general sense. So this idea that separate was no longer equal and that we were supposed to be fully integrated into these universities, and not to say that they weren't, right, already. Um, but what was happening was there was still a lot of de facto segregation happening despite everything that had been passed and everything that was happening. So after uh, the Civil Rights Act, um, there was a group at Illinois. They decided that they were going to initiate this campaign for Project 500. So in 1968, out of a class of 30,000 plus students at the University of Illinois, there were 372 African Americans in the class. And so their idea was by the next year, they wanted to have 500 students on campus. So that meant that they were demanding from the university scholarships, housing, opportunities, because they felt like their student body did not represent the world at large, society at large. Now, as a side note, um, and this reminds me of an earlier, uh, earlier panelist talking about representation in media, when you go into the archives, this is the picture of some of the students that you will find that were involved in this Project 500 initiative. In the last two weeks, I found this picture. So the next year, they did indeed have over 500 people enroll. African-American students enroll in, in, at Illinois. They were promised the moon, and then when they got there, they said, yeah, we're not really doing that. So these students were already on campus. They did not have housing. They were not being allowed to enroll in classes. Suddenly, there was no financial aid. Now, um, at this point, there weren't a lot of African-Americans living on campus, right? They just weren't allowed to do so. There are still very much parts of the town that are segregated so they couldn't even get off-campus housing. So the students that you see in this picture, they stormed the student union and they occupied it. And so this is a picture of them actually being arrested and carted off to uh, the football stadium uh, to be held, right? Because there were too many of them to take them to jail. So this was all before classes started, right? So just in terms of representation and how we are fed our history. Project 500, there's a wonderful initiative that increased the diversity of the student body at University of Illinois. But we don't really want to show you this picture, and someone's going to be upset that I found it because it wasn't in the archives. But this is really how they treated uh, Project 500 students. So that gives you a sense of what's happening, right? Because the Carnegie Scholars came onto campus a year later. So they, they started in 1970. And so the Carnegie Scholars, the Carnegie Fellowship, was a direct outgrowth of Project 500. And Dr. Crowley wrote the grant. Again, it was funded in part by the Carnegie Car Corporation and also the Department of Education. And in the grant proposal, and all of, some of these things are in the uh, archive, the proposal was written for disadvantaged and under-socialized students. And so the language was very uh, abrupt. The language was very pointed. Um, that not only uh, do, did the library school think that they could diversify the profession, but they were also going to save these black students and put them into the profession. Now, just as a side note, I should mention that these students needed to have a 3.5 average successfully uh, acquired bachelor's degrees. Uh, some of the people and all of the scholars obviously are not pictured here, had been in uh, the armed forces, uh, had life experience, had, had other careers. These were brilliant people. 
All right. So, but they were still disadvantaged and under socialized. Okay. Because th those were the words uh, that Dr. Crowley said he knew that he needed to use in order to secure this funding. But what was unfortunate um, is that that is actually how they were treated. So they were treated by other faculty members at the University of Illinois uh, as such, and they were not integrated into the main student body. So when I mentioned earlier that Dr. Crowley actually shepherd, shepherded them through the program, um, he is the reason that they all graduated. Um, I was able to talk to some of them that were willing to speak to me and or provide some type of statement, and they didn't agree on much um, about their experience, but they all agreed that it was Dr. Crowley that got them through this program. Oops, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. All right, so these are the scholars. And this is what we had in the archives, right? These are their ID pictures. Um, I show this, um, and I, I don't know that they explicitly meant for some of these pictures to look like mugshots, um, but they do, and that's why I show them, because it is somewhat representative of how they were treated and how they were regarded. So we are talking about uh, folks that are now uh, edging towards retirement. Some have retired. Um, they have been leaders of major organizations within the field, within the profession. They have led large library systems. And when I did speak to them, uh, some said, uh, you know, I, I, I was in the Navy. Illinois can't do anything to me that the Navy hasn't already done. Right? So some were very matter of fact that this was uh, the point of entry that they needed to get into this profession. Um, others have a very distinct story in their heads about Illinois was amazing. I met my husband there. Right? So everyone has their own story about how they need to uh, address uh, the particular instances and things that they went through in the program. There was also a lot of discussion um, about the students' uh, backgrounds. So not so much that they were un under socialized or disadvantaged, but as part of that rhetoric, they explicitly recruited students from historically black colleges and universities and from urban settings because they essentially they thought that those were easy pickings. There were other students that were from the north. And so there was actually a little tension between the students um, in that regard. So there wasn't as much talk of that, but there were a lot of different factors um, that were compounding their experience at Illinois. And some of the factors uh, became perhaps more overblown than they would have otherwise because they weren't integrated into the regular student body. So it was just this very close, well, I shouldn't say close-knit, but this very close group of 30 students trying to get through this program. In the first year, half of the scholars came uh, in 1970. The second half came in 1971. The scholars that came in 1970 because of this disadvantaged, under-socialized kind of mantra that was happening, they were relegated to remedial courses. And I mean remedial on the Illinois campus, not even into the library school curriculum. And so one of the scholars said to me that she equated it to roughly about an eighth grade reading level education of this remedial work. And so some of them were feistier than others. And they went to Dr. Crowley and said, we're not going to these classes anymore. That's not what we came here to do. Now, again, reminder that these folks had graduated from college. So Dr. Crowley heard them. And then when the second class came in, those students did not have to experience this remedial coursework. So even then, you know, um, think about the students who had done the sit-ins, the 209 and things of that nature. We have the same type of advocacy and demonstration and protesting happen, happening even within the library school. So the main part of the study, right? So I, I was fortunate enough to be able to talk to some of the scholars. Um, but the other part of the work that I did uh, was working with the information that was available in the archives. Now, most of what was available in the archives about these scholars were their um, applications, their personal essays. And what was interesting about some of the essays is that you saw the students use the words disadvantaged and under-socialized, 
because they knew the game they had to play to get into the program. The other main part of the archives were these grade cards. And so these were, I guess, report cards of sorts. Um, they just didn't indicate the grades. So every student had a card filled out for them for every course. All right. So I'm going to read a couple of these to you because the, the handwriting took me many months to get through. Um, but what, we're, what we saw really in these cards were the faculty really pushing back and really rejecting these Carnegie scholars. So they thought that the students were there just for affirmative action and some of the faculty really in, were invested in that rhetoric that they didn't belong, that they were under socialized and this was just some type of social experiment that Crowley was running and that these black students would be gone soon enough. So you could see in the cards, um, there were, I would say maybe a third, a third, a third. There was a third of the faculty that was just adamant uh, that these students were inferior. There was another third that seemed to be rather indifferent and they were just, you know, just another student they had to deal with. And then there was a, a third that included Dr. Crowley that these were um, the staunch advocates of these students. These were the professors and the lecturers that were going to get these students through the program. So you see, you can almost tell, um, and I've, I've uh, blocked out the names to protect the not so in innocent, um, but after a while you could tell if you saw the name, you knew what was coming, okay? So this first card says, attractive and well-groomed, outgoing young person with definite leadership ability, very creative in activities related to work with young adults, lacks self-direction, needs to have definite deadlines set and then needs reminding, has a great future in the profession. Now, I think the most significant thing about these cards is the mention of personal characteristics. So if I'm evaluating a student in a course, I'm supposed to be evaluating how they're interacting with the content. I am not supposed to be commenting about their physical appearance. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, as a side note to this, when I was trying to get this paper published, the reviewers came back and then the editor came back and said, we love it, we think this is really important, but what about the white students? What about them? I, you know, um, so I felt, I felt, I did, I, I felt a little way about it. Um, but I did have to go back and then review another 300 sets, uh, another 300 of these grade cards because the, expectation from the reviewers and the editor was, well, you're just kind of making this up. They didn't really go through this and, and or you're just trying to pull them out. Maybe they treated all the students that way. Of course they didn't. And the, and the secondary review of the cards of some of the white students indicated that there were no personal remarks about uh, physical features and characteristics, demeanor, etc. And they were all, not all, they were, many of them were very effusive. Right? And so a lot of these cards were less about the actual performance in whatever these courses were, but more about what I think about you as a person and how I think that's going to translate and what you're going to do as a professional librarian. So the comments um, in the article that I wrote from this work, some of them were really positive and even about the Carnegie scholars, right? Remember that third of the faculty that were very supportive. Some of the, the cards were questionable in the sense that they were kind of benign, but they almost looked like backhanded compliments. And others were just flat out negative and racist, if, they, <laughs> if I'm gonna actually be honest about it. Okay, so you see this one says keeps to own group, whatever that means. Okay, so here's, here's one, I'm gonna read this one to you as well. Tall, average build, African hairdo, black young woman in the Carnegie program. So now if you can see that there's a difference in the color of the ink, and then there's a, they scratched out the date. So apparently this professor started this in June and that's what they wrote to remember who the student was. So when they went back to fill in whatever comments, they would know who they were talking about. But why do we even have to do that? So the remainder of the card says, was not a strong student in my course lacks much background and experience in the school library field, has taught in New Mexico, libraries and schools inadequate, 
was receptive to suggestions, tried hard. Needs to work under supervision or do practicum work first if possible. Does have interest in the elementary school field. So if we had just gone with that second part, maybe it would have been okay, right? So this was talking about potential and performance, um, but perhaps negated by the idea that we had to notate that she had an African hairdo, because that is going to be the sole indicator of her performance in the professional world. Okay, so you can see in this card, um, and honestly, I, could, I had hundreds and hundreds of these cards. Um, and just as a little anecdote, I had a graduate assistant working with me, and she went to the archives to make copies and scan these cards. And she called me one night, and she said, I did the grade cards, and she said, are you going to be in your office tomorrow? Because I have to give them to you. I don't want these cards in my house. And I, you know, she's a little dramatic. So I was like, I don't understand what the problem is. So I said, yeah, bring them to me, it's fine. And so when I started actually reading them, I, I didn't want them in my house either. Um, <laughs> you know, as, as an African-American woman, as a, a, a minority in this profession, um, this didn't need to be 1970. This could have been directed to me. So to say that this project probably took me about two years to do, not only because of all of the barriers, but because there were points at which I had to put it down and walk away from it. Because not only was it hurtful to me personally, but there are clear parallels to how some of our librarians of color are being treated currently. Why are we still having some of these conversations 40 some years later? All right, so to finish up with these grade cards, you'll see that um, they have changed uh, in appearance and changed for some of the things that they're looking for. There was nothing in the archives that indicated why these grade cards changed um, or why both of these cards um, permitted and or encouraged comments about personal appearances, uh, characteristics, et cetera. All right, so this card says, uh, Mr. So-and-so is an intelligent young man, but apparently was not interested in this course. His performance was far below his capacity. Not doing well but this might not be a pattern, uh, but clearly has great potential. And there was, in this particular instance, no description of physical uh, appearance or demeanor. There were other cards that remarked about skin color, weight, height. Um, there was a lot about personal characteristics. Um, this one would uh, grub for a grade. Um, and just, you know, very stereotypical types of characteristics. And, you know, I should just give her the point so she, she wouldn't be so argumentative and combative all the time. So write all the dog whistles, all of the, the coded language and words. There was another card um, about a, one of the uh, female Carnegie scholars. Um, and after, you know, the, the professor said, you know, she, doesn't, she didn't do well. She's not going to do very well in the profession. And says, she just got married. I wonder what her husband's like and how he can put up with her. Okay, so I, I, I see some kernel clutching in the back. <laughs> but this is what these students had to deal with. And so I am not convinced that these comments were strictly relegated to the cards. Right? I, I'm almost positive that this came out in their interactions with these students. There were other memos in the... Um, archives where people would, uh, other instructors would write notes to Crowley about your students, your people, and you need, essentially you need to go gather your people. And Crowley would send back the most beautifully snarky notes to his fellow faculty, and, and in effect saying, leave them alone, they're fine. So I will end um, with two things. Um, Dr. Crowley left Illinois before the last Carnegie Scholars were able to graduate. So this is to uh, really emphasize what he went through as a faculty member advocating for these young librarians of color. It ruined his career at Illinois. Now he went on to other schools, went on to have a successful career, but it ruined his, his situation at Illinois because he chose to be an advocate. Um, and so, you know, this is some of the same risks that some of us take that really engage in the social justice and diversity related work. It is not work 
that goes unnoticed um, for good and bad reasons. All right, so just want to talk, um, mention to you this idea that history repeats itself, right? So I've mentioned a couple of these things that are still applicable in 2018. So in 1967, when Project 500 first came onto the scene, there were 372 African-American students in the incoming class. In 2014, we had dropped down to 356. So now the students have, we now have a new group, Black Students for Revolution. Bless their hearts, they are doing all of the hard work and getting all of the flack. Um, but they are now calling for Project 1000. So we'll see how long it takes them uh, to reach that particular goal. So I want to allot a few minutes for questions if you have them. Um, but just to finish up with this idea of the challenges of doing this type of work, um, and this was a larger question, I think, for me, not only um, really trying to unearth um, the complicated historical stories that we need to know, because we need to know the history and the context of our profession, but this really spoke to what information is valued, collected, processed, and promoted. Right? So now we're getting into the politics of collection development and archives. Right? So think back to those pictures I showed you about the Project 500 students. That second picture is not in the archives. And that was probably not a coincidence or a mistake, right? We, we want a particular representation if we have to have anything. Um, there's a lot of power in gatekeeping issues, right? So when I was uh, doing the research, there were power in gatekeeping issues at Illinois. I was trying to do some uh, additional supplementary research about the other programs that the Carnegie Corporation funded. Many, many power in gatekeeping issues. Um, there are a lot of places, I won't name names, that have, you know, 30, 40 linear square feet of archives, no pathfinder. They're not processed. No, we won't go in there and tell you what, what's in there. You have to come. Okay, I'm willing to come, but I need to know, you think I'm going through 30, they want me to go through the 30 boxes, right? So there's a lot of history that has yet to be unearthed in this regard, All right, And that relates to our scaling up professionals, which is what I think our panel demonstrated beautifully this morning about our responsibility as educators in addition to uh, being researchers. These are two stories I'm working on uh, currently. Uh, Lillian Lopez uh, is the first Puerto Rican to hold an administrative position at the New York Public Library. Lots of gatekeeping trying to get her, her papers. Um, Dr. Robert Wedgworth is on the right and Dr. Wedgworth um, you can see just a few of he, his positions, um, and he also uh, did his master's degree at Illinois, and he uh, read the article, the Carnegie Scholars piece, and he called me. He said, so when are you coming to talk to me? And he said, I'm 80. You need to come soon. <laughs> and he said the same thing, even given all of his um, you know, really prestigious positions and his uh, impact in the field. He said, no one at Illinois has ever asked me my story. Right? So we need to start asking our elders and our, our, our pioneers their stories while we still can. So with that, um, that is a little bit about the Carnegie Scholars. Uh, and I appreciate your time and attention um, dealing with um, not the, always the most comfortable uh, subject matter. But uh, this was a passion project of mine and probably I feel like perhaps the most important work I've done to date in being able to share these stories in this particular historical episode 